how you doing? I thought I'd share a few things with you about the 200 series Husqvarna's um, and some stuff that just generally covers all saws when you're taking them apart and you're putting them back together. Um, I'm getting some kind of funny emails lately about I think this happened or I think that happened. Let's avoid these things happening. Uh, you can't get too clean on these saws. You can't. Now let me tell you something about that. The saws are filthy. You can blow them out and do everything you want to. But when you disassemble them, first thing I do, take that top lid off, put a rag down the carburetor, you know, down there intake, and I get to blowing. I mean, I blow till I can't blow nothing else out. And uh, that's the way that goes. But I'll tell you what you're left with. How about if I just show you what you're left with? And I'm going to show you some things that help me through this. They're still filthy. Take a paper towel, get your rod down the bottom dead center, and stuff that. I mean, really get that stuff down in there. Because your next step is you got to clean this. I'm not going to get you too close because I'm going to use some air pressure, but you'll get the idea. And uh, you you got more blowing to do. Anything that's loose has got to come off. If it's bonded on the case, I don't generally worry about it at this stage. I use an air gun with that little rubber, just tiny little hole. Uh, it seems to work better than, than than my big one. Okay, so now that we did that, we'll actually start the first stage of the actual cleaning on these. Uh, paper towel. Yeah, the real good stuff. Yeah, Super Tech from Walmart. Cheap as they get. I spray my towel. And I get my I get my services soaking. So I'll guarantee you one thing, no, there's some of that stuff will be baked right on. You know. Get that back down in there. Okay, you made it better, but it's not good enough. You can see that you wouldn't want to put a cylinder back on that. So now that I did, guy cleaned that area first. I just take my rag and I start wiping as much of the crud off as I can get with this rag. Yeah, it's filthy. You don't got to get crazy with this at this stage but get what's loose move it back blow it off okay every step is starting to look better isn't it okay now this does two things get a razor blade or one of these and just kind of, kind of get that where you can scrape across the surfaces, okay, and work your way right, right around that little groove right here. Let me get some of the scrape. Get it loosened up and blow it off. Obviously, you're trying not to blow it in. You don't want to make it worse. But paper towel will catch it. As long as you got it in there, right? 
Now something, when these cylinders are tight and too tight, they'll actually pucker them holes up with them bolts going to hold them on. So don't over tighten them. They gotta be tight. But what you'll see, yeah, you see how I'm holding that just kinda, it, just the slightest angle. And I'm just scraping, okay? And take your time. You ain't in a hurry. You're at peace. Okay. By holding your razor blade upwards, rather than scrape like this, holding it this way, that is a fairly precise edge. That's pretty straight. That tells, shows you where the high spots are on your uh, case, and it works on your cylinder, too. Okay. Now, the old brush out. I got a brass one. You can use a steel one. Just a little bit of fluid on it. And get to scrubbing. You'll know when you got that straight. It'll be nice and smooth. Every time you bump your flywheel, it's going to do that. Just get used to it. Now we're going to wipe it off again. I don't always make things clear of how I do things. I know I don't. I just I assume, you know. I guess that's what happens. I got some crazy ideas, guys. I'm going to build something. I'm going to build some shop tools. I'm going to make life easy for me. Okay, right straight across, and I'm going outward. Especially where them cases joined, I'm doing the same thing, inside to out. Okay, just a little more here. And just before assembly, I do this all over again. I make sure it's real clean because you get, you get a little debris that you're not counting on. But you can see anywhere that there was machine marks, like right here, that tells you where your joints are around your bolt holes. You can see, now you ought to see these bolt holes when that uh, somebody's over torqued them like crazy. They're puckered way up. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. If they're puckered way up and you try to put that back together and you didn't do that, it's, it's up. A few thousands, five, six, seven thousand sometimes. Um, so that gets these cases for preliminary cleaning fairly good. You know, that looks much, much better than when we started. But these are things that are important to me. Now I'm going to set this saw down. I didn't toss it behind me, did I? If I would have, it would have been in a box. But the cylinders. Now, I've already done this cylinder, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a few things you need to know. This is particular to these saws. Now, I've ran my razor blade across that surface. Now, you see them machine marks? See that? That's machine marks. That was kind of a rough machining. 
But when I scrape that with that blade across them like this, I'm not removing the aluminum per se. What I'm doing, and you go two ways, you know. It's like spreading body filter. You see how they really crop up? That makes that finish fairly nice. Something that you can do. Now, I use a, you want a precision file if you do this, and a fine one. This happens to be one of my chisel files, a double bevel. That's what I use to sharpen uh, when I'm chisel filing. I, now, you put your finger in the center of your file, put it in your hole. See that? You can hold on to this, but don't let this do this. And just, just kiss that over it. You know, let me try to get that in just a minute. Lightly, very little pressure, very little pressure, okay, isn't it funny the machine marks that come out of them, okay, that's nice and smooth, now, when you're porting these, I don't care what it is, from the 262, 266, right on up through to 2100, uh, 394, any of them that uh, picks the vacuum up for your impulse. Right there is your impulse. The area where you're sealing your impulse from here to here, don't reduce that. The same thing with this hole. Don't reduce that. Leave that alone. Same thing here. From this here, leave that alone. I've seen far too many of them that's been gouged and hogged, and they can't seal them up. Or if they have, they don't stay sealed very long. Now, you think, well, geez, you know, that kind of obstructs flow. Well, yeah, it does for a bit right in there. It really does. It comes through that intake block, and intake block is shaped just like this. But it has time to straighten out. If you look inside that cylinder, that's got a nice big mouth. You really don't want to make that mouth in a short stroke saw really any bigger. You're trying to keep your momentum uh, going. You're trying to get you're trying to get a high flow characteristic because let's say you took a garden hose and it was that big. And a foot from the end, you decided to make it that big. How much pressure is that going to have? You're still looking for pressure. This is negative pressure. That's vacuum. But we, we call it negative pressure here because we dare to. It's easier to understand negative pressure than it is to say, well, this or that. Okay. Same thing on the bottom of your cylinder. You kind of scuff around that. Now, when you're, if you're brave and you want to take one of these files, you make sure you're doing that. Because, and make sure that's dead level. you got to have a machine that's touch, kind of. And you're kissing across them bolt holes. Okay, you're doing this for a witness mark. You're wanting to see if them bolt holes are uh, high. That's what you're trying to do. I'm going to keep you out of trouble. I got a lot of you guys building saws. Some of you with huge success. Some of you with medium. Some of them you're pussyfooting just a little bit. Good for you. Walk before you run. Now, I've seen these cylinders that uh, around, they've been tightened so tight that around these holes, that file really shows a lot of shiny metal. I mean, a lot. And, uh, like, this cylinder was right. This is, this saw was, uh, it was a factory build. It wasn't uh, anything done with it. Now, remember, I use motorcycle engines assembly silicone, the thinnest coat on these, the very thinnest coat. But 
and any of these that have that type of block where your, your vacuum comes through right here, watch that hole. Don't get silicone in that. Give that a wide berth. Believe me, it's going to, even as thin as you can get it, uh, it's going to migrate toward that hole. Well, if that hole gets partially blocked, you're going to play hell trying to figure out why you can't do anything with that carburetor. And, of course, you remember a few months ago, or a month and a half ago, we was dealing with uh, these uh, 266 through 272 builds, major vacuum leaks. Learned our lesson. Learned that OEM blocks, OEM gaskets. Um, don't, don't, unless you have faith that you're getting a high quality, not from China, uh, you could take them light grade uh, Chinese gaskets. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a challenge. You can put them right in gasoline. Put a lid on it. Let that soak overnight. Pick that out. It's just, it falls apart. It just crumbles apart. That's what happens with them cheap gaskets. So there's a place to get you out of trouble. Okay, on the exhaust, if you want to ensure your seal, you see, I've already started kissing it. See the black spot in the centers? Uh, that's not for me rocking that file around, by the way. Uh, actually, this is just razor blade at this point. What that's from is heat bowing that up. It'll actually sometimes across the surface do that. It'll bowl them up. Don't be afraid to dress them. A lot of times you can take your file... Start at your outside edge, just about that angle, and just draw that across. And you'll see a difference. Just keep doing that. You'll probably notice it on this one. You can, can't you? You can dress that just lightly. And you can make a difference. You don't care if that carbon's all gone out of there. You're trying to get the average surface is what you're trying to do. Don't put too much pressure on your file. And if you think your file might not be absolutely flat, turn it over. You'll see the witness mark from the file change. Believe it or not, this was a brand new file when I started using it a few months ago on the bench. But I needed it. That'll seal right there. You can feel that with your fingernail. That, that'll, that'll seal good. Um, it probably would have anyway. Don't leave carbon on these things. You know, sticking up. I mean, that's what your problem is. Um... I hope this kind of stuff really helps you a lot here. Now, what I'm going to do, actually, is get my piston out because i got to check my timing and port this saw. This one is going to be a nice woods port for a tree guy. Nothing stupid. Just nice, strong logging saw. Just nice and strong. Uh, I kind of prefer that on a lot of these builds because you get your longevity. If you push these numbers too far, what happens is you'll get that little magic and you'll get a lot of power. They don't live near as long. And then he's like, jeez, you know, I expected more than six months out of the darn thing. It's the way it happens. Okay, now, I want to talk to you about something. I have a thought, and there is a lot of you guys that are backyard engineers. Now, those of you that are backyard engineers are just plain got some input. The one thing I had been looking for is a bump press. You know, just like that. It works like a drill press, but it's a one ton or two ton or whatever bump press. And uh, 
they're fairly expensive. You can get some cheap ones, I see, but your shipping gets you because they're heavy. And I normally we have sales we go to and you can find them. But you got one hand on your part and one hand on the lever. Okay, here's what I was thinking. Um, I got brake problems with my one ton there. I still haven't got the rear brakes fixed yet. Uh, that's uh, this weekend's project, so good for us. Okay, what I want to do is to be able to push bearings out, seals in and out, uh, wh whatever I need to do uh, on split cases. So what I want... I, I, if I got one here to split, nope, not right handy. I got one to split. I got, in fact, I probably tomorrow I'll get the, that one split. Um, anyways, you've seen them split before and you got your bearing there. Okay. What I want to do is be able to push a very short distance, just very short. Even if I have to add a, a quarter inch shim and push a little further. But I want to be able to push having two hands. I want to be able to hold things. Because, you know, having one hand and doing it, or having somebody help you. Colin's good help, but he's not here all the time. And then sometimes you mash the other guy's finger, but, you know. I generally do the holding because I can, you know, these old fingers can handle a little more mashing. You know, I got a little more mashing left. It, uh, what I want to do is take a master cylinder. A fairly decent sized master cylinder. It can push a lot of fluid, like off a one ton truck. Yeah, I got that idea when I was pumping the brakes, when I bled my front brakes the other day. Yeah, that's what we've been working on. We've been working on stuff the uh, last three days. And an eye appointment. I'll tell you how that went in a minute. So I'm pumping this. I says, well, you know what? If I had this right on my bench, that's hydraulic. I'll tell you what, a master cylinder's got a lot of power. It really does. I think I developed an air leak in my uh, air holes on my compressor. I don't know how that happened. Okay, so what happens is, what if you took a master cylinder that had a large bore? And you took either a short, fat cylinder, hydraulic cylinder, or even a, like a brake caliper, you know, and... Fashion that with a brake, a foot lever, so that you had a fixture that you could uh, put your cases in, or anything you want to push short distance with a lot of power. You could step on your brake, you could hold your part, you could step on your brake pedal right on the bench in this fixture and push bearings out push bearings back in you would have you would have a feeling of pressure you could go so far in that brake line to put a pressure gauge right here somewhere where you could see this so you knew exactly how much pressure you was building they'll build more than you think but it's not going to be for a long stroke it's really not and we don't need a long stroke not when bearings I should have one on the back of the bench I always do Here's a bad one. Bearings are that thick. It ain't got to move far, does it? What do you think of that idea? I think that begun because you can take and build any tooling you want that that will uh, you you can push with any diameter. It doesn't matter. Um, I think in our future you're going to see us have a little lathe. We don't need a very big lathe. Uh, I'm looking at. Something with an 8-inch swing. Don't need to be long. We're looking. We're looking. See what we can do. Uh, they don't give the darn things away. But I want a 3 and a 4 jaw chuck. Uh, I want something I can do threads with. Uh, I, I want to be able to do more than I'm doing. I'll tell you what I'm thinking. You know all I got on these Macs. And other saws that... You have to, they have a removable cap on the big end of the rod. I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to be able to change that rod to a modern style rod. Now, Inconel is a material 
that's really pretty cool. It's uh, untreated. It's it's really reasonably uh, easy to machine. It's not bad, but you can heat treat in canal very easy to very hard. Now, what I want to do, I want to take these cranks that are one piece, and I want to cut the left and right half off, locate from center, be able to bore for a pin. And if there's a pin available that's the right length, use it out of another crank. But I want to be able to have a proper bearing with good hardness right there on the big end of these rods. Now I'll tell you what that'll do for us. On these oddball saws like these uh, Pioneers, Home Lights, Max, you know, on and on and on, Remingtons, this stuff that you just want to cry because you know you can do something with it, but I could use this piston in it because it will fit, but my problem is I got a deck height problem. I got this other problem. Now, I've been wanting to do some longer rod uh, chainsaws because longer than what they come with. Some of them are fairly short. I'd like to lengthen the rod just a little bit. And what that does is it parks that piston at top dead center just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And when that fires, that lets that absorb that kinetic energy and it comes down much harder, much harder. And, and then there's one particular case. The saw has got too long of a rod for the boring stroke. Um, yeah, there's formulas for that, but I use gut instinct. I know on the small block Chevys that uh, when we went from a 5.7 rod to a 6 inch rod, you know, 5.7 inches to a 6 inch rod, the pin position was at the top next to the reel next to the rings. But we noticed an increase in torque. The car pulled hard. Yeah, yeah, it did. Now, uh, you got you got to consider something. It takes longer to get the piston coming down, but when it starts, it's going faster, okay? Uh, it, the speed of a piston is varied. It, it slows down coming to the top, quite rapid to the center, slows down coming to the bottom. And that long rod is going to park that. That's going to slow that down a lot longer. It lets you have time to fire that. Now, what that's going to do when we get to that point that's going to let me go another couple degrees on my uh, exhaust opening number. It will. It'll let me do that with the same torque. Now, uh, this is what I predict. Is it going to work in the real world? I don't know. We're going to find out right here. But, neat little tool to push bearings out, press things together, press things. I'd probably use it all kinds of different ways if it worked like a thing. Just, it, I don't care if it's a half inch stroke, quarter inch stroke, just something of a stroke to start something. Uh, but that'd be nice having a lathe because then I could take, because ideally, when you're pushing on them bearings, uh, you want to be pushing on the outside ring, okay, when you're pushing them in. When you're pushing them out, you really don't care. And I'll tell you why, because you, you're changing that bearing for a reason. It ain't any good. Well, you end up pushing on the center. Okay? And uh, I do use, on a lot of saws, I use a heat gun. I get them cases 300 degrees, 350 degrees with a heat gun, and then start popping them out, popping them in. I, I, I like to get them to relax. I'll tell you the only ones I don't is the OEM MS660s. 66 mags. Um, I put them in and out cold. They they just don't seem to be a problem. But like the 372s, these 272s, they are a problem. And uh, so it's kind of nice to have that. Um, hopefully we've gathered some good information that's useful for you guys. I had fun making this kind of video. I'm going to try so hard to talk about things from gap A to gap B to gap C. Um, just like this, for instance. Uh, little things like this are just 
for you guys out there that are chainsaw fanatics and fiends and nuts just like I am, you'll say, yeah, well, I already do that. I know that. But then there's other guys that are wanting to get into this and they haven't yet. And you're going to shoot yourself in the foot by omitting steps, especially the ones I forget to share. Okay, that's it. I'll take care of you tomorrow too, okay? We're going to have another nice little video. Take care. Goodbye.